<clears throat> okay, good evening everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, it's a great covet to be in Rabbi Leibowitz's shul. And um, whatever words were mentioned, we could apply uh, many time, many fold over to your illustrious Rav. And uh, I wish him continued bracha v'hatzlacha here in this Beis HaKnesses. We know that uh, tomorrow is a very big day. Many of you are going to the rally. And I think uh, tonight's shir will be an appropriate preparation for tomorrow and for the times that Klal Yisrael are facing right now. Because, yeah, Klal Yisrael is in a very dire predicament, or so it seems. And we're facing one particular enemy, Yishmael. And in order to combat an enemy, you need to know who the enemy is. You need to be able to really identify what are what is the personality of Yishmael? What is his physical and spiritual personality? What are his characteristics? And what are the techniques that we need to use to be able to overcome him? So let me bring to your attention, you know, we talk about Yishmael and we know his progeny today. Let's go back to the origin and try to study, you know, where some of this rock comes from. First we know that in Lashon HaKodesh in Hebrew, typically, we always utilize a noun before the pronoun. For example, bayis gadol, adam gadol, adam katan, bayis katan. So we always use a noun and then the adjective. So oddly, when Yishmael is introduced to us, we know he's called para adam. Para means wild, adam means man. But technically, according to the rules of uh, Hebrew grammar, the noun should come first, so it should be adam para, man who's wild. But no, Yishmael is Pere Adam. So Rabbi Shua Leib Diskin, probably you've heard this before, you're familiar with this. Rabbi Shua Leib Diskin points out that Yishmael's identity, his personality is Pere. His reality is wild. What kind of wild? What's the adjective? How do we describe his wildness? Oh, he's the human kind. But his identity is Pere. And then I saw something that was so astounding, and I really wanted to... Uh, Mark at this. I think I could have come out with a clip on this that would have gone viral, but for personal safety, I protected. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, but I did. I didn't milk it for what it could have been. When Yishmael was dying of thirst, so his mother cast him aside, and uh, the, the pasuk says she distanced herself from him. Rachai kimetachave keshes a bow's an arrow's length. In, in other words, you know, the amount that a bow could be shot, that's how far Hagar went away from Yishmael. Why? Because the Torah says she couldn't bear to see the death of her child. So I never really thought too much about that. She couldn't bear to see the, de the death of her child. So go away a foot, two feet, ten feet. Why the distance of an arrow's length? The Bartanura says something astounding. Bartanura says, that Hagar was afraid. Yishmael was dying. He could lose it. In a moment of uh, insanity, Yishmael might say, well, once I'm dying, I might as well kill my mother. Kimin hag ha'yishmaelim, the Bartanura says, that when they go down, they'll take anyone with them. And therefore, his own mother was afraid. You know, he was the first, I don't even want to say the words. Okay, so if you want to know where the whole concept comes from, it's already in their origin. I mean, to me, that was just a, a stunning uh, discovery. So this is the enemy that we're dealing with. And Rav Hutner explains, you know, what is it? Why do they have such bad blood against us? Why do they hate us so much? What's the root of this animosity? So basically, it's her fault. It's Sarah's fault. Sarah said, Garesh has ben ha'ama hazais chase him out of the house. You see, Esau, what's interesting is, Esau, the Christian world, never tampers with the Old Testament. They accept the Old Testament. Because there's nothing about that document that's threatening to them. After all, Esau is born from the patriarchs. And so, okay, they tamper with the New Testament, but they have no problem with the Old Testament. But according to the Old Testament, Yishmael has been banished. He's thrown out. Sarah didn't say, you know, send him to a special ed school. Sarah didn't say, get him extra tutoring after school. Sarah said, throw him out. And therefore, Yishmael always carries this animosity of rejection 
from Sara Imenu. So let me begin this evening by telling you uh, a, a story that's personal to our family, something that my grandfather wrote in his personal memoirs about the experiences he had in the Holocaust. My grandfather was in Auschwitz. He passed away a few years ago at 106 years old. My grandfather was in Auschwitz. He saw Eichmann in Auschwitz. And Eichmann inv invited a special guest from Auschwitz to enjoy with him as they brutalized Jews. And this special guest, his name was King Hussein, the Grand Mufti from Jerusalem. The Grand Mufti from Jerusalem came to Auschwitz. He sat arm in arm with Eichmann and they would march Jews in front of them in a way that they would never be able to have progeny. And that was their entertainment. And my grandfather says, when, when the Mufti came to Auschwitz, that was a fulfillment of the end of this week's parsha. Vayelech Esav el Yishmael. Okay? Now those are very deep words. Because I want to share with you uh, an astounding revelation of the Vilna Gain. The Vilna Gain teaches us, and let me introduce it as follows. You see, at the end of the parsha, Esav is fuming. Esav had just been duped for a second time. Yaakov Avinu stole the, the birthright, and then Yaakov Avinu took the brachos. And the Pasuk says, Vayistoim Esav liyakov. Esav hated Yaakov. He said, Yikruvu yimei evil achi. I can't wait until the morning for my brother comes, and I'm going to kill my brother. So the Pasuk says, Esav hated Yaakov. But it's, so to speak, it's like, uh, we don't know what the conclusion of the Pasuk is. In other words, Esav hated Yaakov, okay, and what's happening now? Esav hated Yaakov, so what's Esav going to do to Yaakov? It doesn't really say what Esav's going to do to Yaakov. But then the Pasuk says, Esav went and he married Machalas, the daughter of Yishmael. So it almost sounds like because Esav hates Yaakov, therefore Esav married the daughter of Yishmael. Says the Vilna Gaon, yes. In fact, if Esav and Yishmael ever get together, they would destroy the entire world. You hear this? Now it's a good thing that Yishmael and the Western world don't get along. But if there would ever be a union, you know, if we would ever, meaning on that great day, or a terrible day, when Bill Clinton stood there, with the Prime Minister of the State of Israel and Yasser Arafat and somehow we have this union of Yishmael and the Western world it's a disaster of epic proportions so you, you might think it would be wonderful you know why can't we all get along let the United States of America get along with Iran no 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 bad news if the Western world would ever be in cahoots with Yishmael, they would destroy the world. So my grandfather was saying, you want a picture of what the world looks like when Esau and Yishmael come together? Auschwitz. Okay. And that's why Esau hated Yaakov. So where did Esau go to look for a shidduch? He married the daughter of Yishmael. So I want to bring to your attention, can you think of another example in history where Esau and Yishmael got together? So we have Auschwitz. We have this week's parsha. Well, let's think for a moment. Was there ever a time in history where there was a danger that the Jewish people would be annihilated? Was there ever a looming decree? La hashmid, la haroi guliabed as kalayhudim. Could you think? Times of Purim. So who are the main characters, you know, who are the personalities in times of Purim? Achashverosh. Who is he? What is he? He's Persian. Not quite a Yishmaeli. But Haman, he's from Esav. So it's like, not a complete mixture, but is it? And that's going to be part of today's topic. We have a tradition, there are four exiles. You know what they are? There's Babylon, there's Persia, Media. I always say the biggest Gullus is the Media, right? That's the biggest Gullus of all, the Media. Can't believe a word they say. They make up information because you are addicted to checking it out on the t every two and a half seconds. So they have to make things up. Most of it, you know, Biden is pressuring Israel for um, ceasefire, for human humanitarian pauses. No, he's not. He is, right? Depending on the minute, those are the different reports. 
So you have Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Okay? Those are the four exiles. And you could bet your bottom dollar that any time you see the number four in Beratius, the Medrash will say the number four represents the four Golasim. For example, all the way in the beginning of Beratius, I was asked um, for some source sheets. So here you have the Medrash in number one. On the opening, Sukkim in the Chumash, V'ha'aretz ha'isa soihu v'avoihu v'choyshech al p'nei sahoim. Soihu, the Medrash says, is Bavel. Avoihu uh, is Madai, like it says, V'ayav hilu l'havies haman. Choyshech is Yavan, the Greeks made a decree that they try to darken our eyes with their Gezerois. And then Alpnei Sahaim is the fourth Golos, Golos Raimi. And throughout Sefer Beratius, whenever you have the number four, the Medrash always interprets it as a reference to the four Golosim. For example, the four rivers in Gan Eden, or at the Brisbane Habasarim, when Avram Avinu sees Ema, Chashecha, Gedoila, Noifelas, Olav, the four Golosim. And a major question is, and the obvious question is, that here we are, we're presumably in the fourth Golos, and a new power rears its head and is contending to be reckoned a Golos. Who's that? Yishmael. Yishmael. I mean, do they not commit enough atrocities to be considered a Golos? Why is Yishmael not on the list? That's a major question. You have Babylon, you have Persia, you have Greece, you have Rome. But what about Golos Yishmael? Why is Yishmael not on the list? Good question, right? I'm going to share with you another interesting thing. The Gemara says in Masech Tavay Dezar that at the end of days, God's going to take out the Sefer Torah, and he's going to say, anyone who learned this, anyone who contributed to this, anyone who supported this, come receive your reward. And all the nations are going to clamor and they're going to gather and they're going to say, we supported Tyra, we supported the Jews, we helped build yeshivas, we gave yeshivas government funding. All the nations of the world are going to say, we supported the Tyra. So the Rebbe Hashem says, no, come on, let's make some order over here. You can't all come in at the same time. Order, please. So the Gemara says the first nation to come in and claim that they supported the Torah was Roimi, Rome. And the Gemara says, what is Rome going to say? We built many bathhouses, we built many streets, we built Central Avenue, we built all the shops, we built all the museums, we amassed silver and gold. Everything we did was so that the Jewish people could learn Torah. And God's going to say, you, you fools. Yeah, that's... That's, it is so the Jewish people can learn Tyra, but that wasn't your intention. So Rome walks out dejected, brokenhearted, and then after Rome comes Persia, Paras. And the Gemara says, Persia says, listen very carefully, we waged many wars, we conquered many cities, we made many battles, Everything we did was so that the Jewish people could learn Tyra. God's going to say, no, 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 no. You fools, that's not why you did it. So, Ro so Rome walks out dejected, and Persia walks out dejected. Asks the Gemara, why only these two nations are going to come and claim reward? And the Gemara says, because they are the two most hush of nations, the two most important nations. Ask the Gemara, what makes them so important? Says the Gemara, because they will be the only two nations standing in the end of days. The only two superpowers who will remain in the end of days is Roimi, Rome, and Paras, Persia. Says the Gemara, the Hanach Mashchi Malchusayu Ad They will be the only powers that will last until Mashiach comes. So let's analyze this. Let's study this. Rome. The, you know anything about the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire is long gone. You want to? You want something about the Roman Empire? You want to see a relic of the Roman Empire? You could go to the British Museum. You know what they have over there? They have a teapot, but not the whole thing. Just a handle that a Roman drank from. 1800 years ago. That's the Roman Empire. Th did it last until Mashiach comes? No. What about the Persian Empire? The Persian Empire is long gone. The Greeks conquered the Persians. So what does it mean that Rome will last until Mashiach comes 
and Persia will last until Mashiach comes. So Rome is simple. Judea Christian val values have been continued through the Western world. The United States is a spiritual heir of the Roman Empire. The United States was built on Judea Christian values. It happens to be now, I don't know if it has any values. But the country, the founding fathers built the United States based on Judea Christian values. So the Roman Empire will last until Mashiach comes. But what about Persia? Say Iran. Now, Iran, Iranians are not Persians. They're not genetically Persians. They're not ethnically Persians. So what does it mean that Persia will last until Mashiach comes? That's one Gemara. I'm going to share with you another Gemara. A Gemara in Masech Yuma. The Gemara asks, in the end of days, there'll be two powers, Rome and Paras. Rome and Persia? Who's going to destroy who? Now, if you're an American, this is not a very settling Gemara. Because you hope the Gemara is going to say, Rome will destroy Persia. You hope, right? The Gemara says it's a machlekas. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, in the name of Rabbi, says, Rome will fall to Persia. That's not a very comforting feeling. You know, you just did your kitchen, and now what? The Persians are going to come, and what are they going to do? But that's what the Gemara says. Rome will fall to Persia. The Gemara brings the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. Rome will fall to Persia. What, what happened? The Persian Empire is going to come out of the, the dustbin and they're going to conquer Rome? How could that be? But then the Gemara brings an opinion. No, Persia will fall to Rome. Okay, that makes us feel a lot better. But what's the Persian Empire doing around in the end of days? So we have to learn an amazing revelation of the Maral. Okay, I know everyone has to, you know, hit the sack early tonight because you have to wake up at 3 a.m. to get breakfast before you get on the bus. But this is a worthwhile maral. Listen to this maral. The maral wants to know, why is Yishmael not one of the four exiles? Why is he not on the official who's who list of exiles? So the maral gives two answers. I'm going to share both answers with you. The first answer I like very much, the Maral says it's not the definitive answer. The Maral says something amazing. Do you know what a Malchus is? Do you know what a Golos is? There was somebody by the name of King David. King David was Melech Yisrael. Do you know what the job of Melech Yisrael, do you know why the Jewish people have Malachim, have kings? You see, God is the king of the world. Hashem is Melech HaOlam. And God has a throne. And how many legs hold up God's throne? Four legs. Who are the four legs? Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David. Very good. David. David is Regal Ravi. That's why David comes from with Shevet Yehuda. When Yehuda was born, it says, Vata Amoid Miled, a lesson of Amida. It gives stability to the throne of God. When David HaMelech is around and he's the king of Israel, through his sovereignty, through his monarchy, is reflected the Malchus of Hashem. So the world recognizes God's dominion through the ages of David HaMelech. Come the Babylonians and they destroy the temple and they overthrow Malchus based David and basically what they're doing is, says the Maral, they're usurping, they're hijacking the Malchus Hashem gave to David to reflect his Malchus, the Babylonians are taking to themselves. So now we're, we're relegated to exiles, and our Malchus belongs to the Babylonians. Then the Persians come and they overthrow the Babylonians and they take our Malchus. And then the Greeks come and they overcome the Persians and they've taken our Malchus. And Rome has taken our Malchus. But Yishmael never takes our Malchus. Yishmael's source of power is the prayer of Avraham Avinu. When Hashem tells Avraham, Avraham, I'm going to give you a child, Yitzchak, Avraham said, Yitzchak, Lu Yishmael Yichya Lefanecha, if only I could have Yishmael. By the way, we're upset at Avraham for saying that. 
The Zayar HaKadr says, we complain, Avraham, you're not our father, why didn't you pray for us the way you prayed for Yishmael? Says the Maral, Malchus is a power that's taken from the Jewish people. Yishmael has an independent source of power. So they're not technically one of the Golosim. That's the first answer of the Maral. But the Maral says, I like my second answer better. You know why Yishmael is not a Golos? Because it is. Which one is it? Persia. What does Yishmael have to do with Persia? Says the Maral, these four categories of Golos are general character traits of four types of Golos. And the defining characteristic of Persia is they wage a lot of wars. And they conquer a lot of cities. And that, are, that is the characteristic of Yishmael. Therefore, Yishmael is Persia. They're one and the same. They're synonymous. Coming back to the various Gemaras, I think this really opens up the heavens for us. Because when the Gemara says there'll be two nations standing in the end of days, Rome and Persia, we ask, but the Persian Empire is long gone. Not, no, it hasn't. No, it's not. Because Yishmael is still alive and kicking. So in the end of days when we say there are two powers, Rome and Paras, that's Rome, America, and Yishmael. And that's exactly what we see today. I mean, the Gemara could not be more black and white of what will take place in the end of days. Can you imagine this? 1,500 years ago, the Gemara was written at a time when Persia was long gone. Who knows if Rome would still be around? The Gemara predicted in the end of days there'll be two nations standing, Rome and Paras. And now we're learning Paras is Yishmael. And who's going to beat who? It's not clear. It's not clear. According to most opinions, Rome will fall to Persia. America falls to Yishmael, according to most opinions in the Gemara. There is an opinion, Yishmael will fall to Rome. Yishmael will fall to America. And until very recently, this Gemara made me very queasy. I mean, it's frightening. Because the Gemara, see, and, and I would like to share with you, because wouldn't it be nice if we had a definitive view of who will be the last nation standing? And I think I found a definitive view. And it might not be good news. But something that I read recently gave me a different perspective of this, and I think it's a little bit more uh, assuring. And I'm not here to make you feel good. That's your rabbi's job. He has to make you feel good. I'm, I'm just here once in a while, you know? So I, I just report the facts. You know, when people talk about the Roman Empire and the fall of the Re Roman Empire, if you're not a student of history, you would think that an invading nation came that would overpower the Roman Empire and uh, defeated it and conquered it. Is that what happened? Was the Roman Empire ever conquered? No. What happened to the Roman Empire? There was political disillusionment. And there was internal corruption. And they recognized that they had no values and they were bereft of any ideals. And it just disintegrated from within. Nobody ever conquered the Roman Empire. But whatever ideals it was built upon, had no, no, it did not endure. And it just corroded. And it disintegrated. And in that sense, you know, you might feel a little better. In other words, maybe the Gemara is not saying which nation will drop nuclear weapons on the other. The question is, in the end of days, there are basically two ideals in the world. There's the ideal of extremism and uh, jihad. And then there's liberty and democracy. And the question is, which one of these values will corrode and disintegrate and just cease to exist before the other? That may be what the Gemara means, but be it as it may. I think it would be interesting if we could dis discover some kind of definitive viewpoint 
of who will be the last nation standing before Mashiach comes. And what's amazing is, we're going to find the answer in this week's parsha. So here we are. I have to mention it's Rosh Chodesh Kislev. And Rosh Chodesh is a beautiful time to be mitzapeh for the coming of the Geula. So, I want to share with you another idea. You ever hear there are two Mashiachs? Yeah, I'm sure you all heard the two. There's Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. What in the world they are? Nah, nobody ever told me. Right? Do you know what they are? When do they come? Why do I need two? Can't we just have one? What's this all about? By the way, it's very interesting. Arizal writes that there are two brachas in Shemana Esrei about Malchus based David. There's Rishalayim Ircha Barachim Tashuv, the Chisei David Avdacha Mehira Lesaycha Tachen, and then there's the bracha of Es Tzemach David. Why do I need two brachas? So Arizal says something amazing that there are two Mashiachs. There's Mashiach ben Yosef, who precedes Mashiach ben David. Mashiach ben Yosef is the foundation, is like the throne, is the Yesoid to allow Malchus based David to come. When you say the words in Yerushalayim Mircha, the Chisei David Mehera Lesaycha Tachin, be Mechavein, have in mind that the Rebbe Hashem should send Mashiach ben, da- ben Yosef. Mashiach ben Yosef is called Kisei David, the throne of David. And then when you get to the next bracha and you say, Ki Lishu Ascha Kivinu Kal Hayayim, that's when you should have in mind, Rebbe Hashem, send us Mashiach ben David. Okay? What are these two Mashiachs? The Gemara refers to them as Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. <coughs> Mashiach ben Yosef, what animal is Yosef compared to in the Chumash? He's called Bechar Shoiroi Hadarlai, the firstborn ox. Yosef is called an ox. What does Mashiach ben David refer to as? Ani v'roichev al chamar. Poor man, riding, not an infinity, not a Lexus, not a Mercedes, a donkey. So Yosef is compared to an ox, and Meshach Medov is compared to a donkey. It's very interesting. There's an amazing Vilna guy in. Did you know that you're not to plow with an ox and a donkey together? Most people in North Woodmere, I'm told, they don't plow, not with oxen and not donkeys, right? Is that true? I heard that recently. Yeah. So, but if you had an ox and you had an a donkey, you could not plow with the two of them together. Why? It's shotness, it's climb. You can't pl- plow with the two of them together. Why not? So you say, I don't know, uh, the Torah says you can't do it. You know, you're not allowed to have wool and linen together. Why not? Oh, it's a chayk. I don't know why. I'm going to tell you why. The first two brothers in the history of the world, what were their names? Cain and Heva. Cain brought a carbon. What was his carbon? Flax, pishtan, linen. Heva brought a carbon. What was his carbon? Um, sign, wool. Says the Pirkei de Rebelezer. Cain, he was a bad guy. Hevel, he was okay. You can have evil in the world. You just can't mix wool and linen. You can't mix the two together. The reason you're not aware of Shatniz is because Shatniz is an admixture of Kayin and Hevel. Fine. Comes the Gra, and the Gra says, Esav was Kayin, Hevel is Yishma. If you ever put wool and linen together, you're combining Esav and Yishmael. And we said, if you ever combine Esav and Yishmael, what would happen? They destroy the world. So Shatniz literally destroys the world. Because Shatniz is a mixture of Kayin and Hevel, a mixture of Esav and Yishmael. Esav is compared to a bull. And Yishmael is compared to what animal? Shivu lachem poyim. Hachamar is compared to a donkey. If you ever mix an ox and a donkey, you're mixing Esav and Yishmael, you could destroy the whole world. That's why you can't plow with an ox and a donkey. Therefore, says the Gra, in the end of days there will be two exiles. There will be the Gullus of the Shar, Esav. From that Gullus, who's going to take us out? 
Mashiach ben Yosef, the Bechar Shoyer Hadar Lai. Then there's going to be the Golos of the Chamar, Yishmael. Who's going to take us out of Golos Yishmael? The Ani Vareich of Achamar, Mashiach ben David. So according to the Gra, what comes first? Mashiach ben Yosef or Mashiach ben David? Mashiach ben Yosef. Which means, first we will leave Golos Edoim. First will come the fall of Golos Edoim. And then will come the fall of Golos Yishmael. So this is um, pretty, at least a clear opinion. That first Edoim crumbles, and then Yishmael crumbles. Let me bring you another um, source. Sorry to bring up a sensitive topic. I know it's a little bit away, but you know how by the you know on Pesach, <laughs> on Pesach the Seder ends with Chad Gadya. Yeah, you know the song. So how many characters do you have in the song? You've got eight characters in the song. Besides the kid, the Gadya, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you have the cat. One night this week, my kids were so excited. Um, a kitten, a beautiful kitten, was born on my back porch. And they said, it was the cutest thing in the world, and they were begging me, could I keep it? Could I keep it? Could I keep it? They took pictures of it, and it was, they said it was beautiful. I said, you could keep it for how long? One minute. <laughs> um, you have a cat. You have a dog. You have a stick. You have a fire. You have water. You have a bull. You have a shaychet, you have a malach Yeah? You have eight characters. And then God comes and He calls it a day. There's a Rashi in Zechariah. Rashi in Zechariah says that the four Golosim, which are again Bavel, Madai, Yavan, and Edoim, each Golos is a dual Golos. It's like a, it has a duality to it. So what does that mean? Bavel is Babylon, the Chaldeans, Kazdim. Persia, Persia, Media, Parasmadai. Yavon, Yavon, Moikdan, Greece and Macedonia. And Edoim, Esav, and Yishmael. Okay, so you have eight exiles. The four exiles are really eight exiles. And you have four character, eight, um, eight characters in Chadgadia. Says Reb Chaim Knievsky, the eight characters in Chadgadia correspond to the eight exiles until God comes and He wipes out all the exiles. So now it would be very interesting to try to identify which exile each personality is, right? Because the last two are the Shoichet and the Malach HaMavas. So if we could identify who's the Shoichet and who's the Malach HaMavas, we're going to know who's the penultimate Golos and who's the final Golos. So the cat, the cat is Babylon. The Gemara compares Nebuchadnezzar to a cat. He howled like a cat, the Gemara says. And Belshazzar would drink wine like a dog, Chazal say. And Koresh from Persia beat his enemies with like a stick. And that he was from Media. And Achashverosh from Persia, he was like a fire. His anger burnt in him. And then you had Alexander, the great of Macedonia. It says he went to the Garden of Eden and he, they sprinkled him with water. He is the water. And then you have the Greeks made a decree we have to write on the horn of an ox that we have no connection to Hashem. So they're the ox. So drum roll please. We have two characters left. We have the Shoichet and we have the Malach HaMavas. Now I'm an American. And if I would have written a commentary of Chad Gadya, let me tell you what I would have said. I would have said, you know who the Shoichet is? Yishmael. After all, Avraham takes the cow. Vayitein el hanar la'asoy soy soy. He gives the cow to who? To Yishmael. To do what? To shecht. Rashi says to be mechanichim in mitzvahs. Which mitzvahs? Hachnasas orchim and shechita. Isn't it amazing? Look at the power of Chinuch. Avraham was Mechanech Yishmael in two mitzvahs. 
Shechita and Achnas HaSorchim. And until today, the two mitzvahs that our cousins have been doing for thousands of years, Shechita, wherever you go around the world, they, they, have, they have meat that's shechted, they shecht meat, and Achnas HaSorchim. That's what they're known for, at least among their own. That's a fact. You see the power of Chinuch. Avram was Mechanich, Yishma, and two mitzvahs. Until today, those are the two mitzvahs they're proficient in. And who's the Malcham of us? I mean, my grandfather saw Dr. Mengele. What was he called? He's the angel of death. That's what I would have said. That's how I would have interpreted Chad Gadya. And then I would have said, I could stay here in America until Mashiach comes. Because the penultimate Golos would be Yishmael, and the final Golos would be Adoim. But Reb Chaim Kinevsky says, no. The Shoichet is Adoim. He brings the Gemara and Psachim that Rome shechted calves endlessly. And the angel of death is the Para Adam Yishmael, that everyone else plunders money, the Medrash says, and Yishmael takes souls. Says Rebchaim Kayevsky, the last Golos, Golos Yishma. And then Rebchaim Kayevsky says, look in the Balaturim in this week's Parsha. Do you know what the Balaturim says in this week's Parsha? Well, we have to read something from the sheet. Look at number 26. <clears throat> the end of this week's Parsha talks about all the various leaders of Yishmael. It ends, Al Pnei Kol Echav Nafal. When Yishmael falls in the end of days, Oz Yitzmach Ben David. That's when Mashiach comes. So that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing their downfall. They expedited it. They, we could have left them alone. They were sitting there. We gave. We disengaged from our land. We let them live there. By letting them live there, we were prolonging the coming of Mashiach. They said, come on, Klal Yisrael, you need Mashiach. So they started up with us, so that we could witness their downfall. But one thing is, we know for sure, when you see the downfall of Yishmael, you know David is around the corner. That's what the Balaturim says in this week's parsha. So there cannot be a more ominous week, really, to stand up for Klal Yisrael and for Eretz Yisrael, and as a session, we should continue to see the downfall of Yishmael. And as we mentioned before, that Yishmael married his daughter to Esav. So that's what we say in Slichos, Kale Sa'ir V'choisnai. You know what that means? Destroy Sa'ir Esav and his father-in-law. Right, because Yishmael was Esav's father-in-law. So we wish both parties, Esav and Yishmael, Hatzlacha Rabba, in uh, battling it out. And Be'ez HaShem, we should see Al Pnei Kalech of Nafal and Ve'ela Todos Yitzchak. We should see the flourishing of Mashiach ben David. Shayavai v'mher v'yamenu. Amen. Thank you.